Hi, welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSchool.com. So uh, those of you who have been watching my channel for a while know that I have been making a series of videos about Chiro Marchetti's Kipper deck, the Fin de Siècle. Uh, so I was set upon my return from the German Playing Card Museum to go ahead and continue in my series of Kipper videos when several people, uh, in fact a large number of people, wrote to me and said, look dude, Fortune, we haven't had time to actually watch all these videos and use these techniques. We are feeling a bit overwhelmed by the pace of the videos, although I thought they were a bit slow in coming, maybe every week or two, but still I realized people are busy, and so just to have a lot of videos come down in a short period of time may seem overwhelming to them. So uh, they just wanted me to, you know, pause for a bit, hold, so they would have the holidays and a week or so after to actually go through these videos again, watch them, experiment with the techniques, really get a handle on what I was saying or suggesting about the Kipper deck. And, I certainly thought that was a fair request and one that I honored, am, am honoring right now. Uh, so with that in mind, I asked them uh, what other topics they would like to see a video on. And quite a few people uh, came back to me. Some wrote me on my Facebook page, some sent me private emails, uh, saying that they are really also very interested in my work with Tarot. Uh, and would I mention my crucial list of key books or texts uh, around learning to read and advancing one's knowledge of Tarot? So after a lot of thought, I decided that this is a very important topic. Uh, it's certainly important to me personally. It's one that I've talked about for a long time. Uh, it's somewhat controversial, so please forgive me for that. Uh, I'm not here to offend anyone or say, again, that my way you know, it's my way or the highway or that I have the only way, but this is the way that I do read cards and this is my approach to cards. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, then I hope that you'll find uh, this video interesting and enlightening. Uh, my take on Tarot is I think people who've known me for a long time, uh, but again, many people are new to the channel so they won't know, so I'm just gonna say this flat out, is a choice-centered approach to Tarot. It's one oriented in cultural theory, in psychology, and in language. I realize that this is very, very different than the way that most people approach Tarot, and the books that I'm going to tell you on my list are not at all usual for Tarot lists. No, not at all. Um, I am not going to talk about books by Mary Kay Greer or Rachel Pollack. This is, uh, for example, not because I dislike them. Heavens, they're my friends, and I, you know, have a high regard for both of them. But it's just not the way that I read cards at all, uh, or a way that I or my clients have found useful. Um, so, however, if you're attracted to that, which is the quote-unquote standard method of reading tarot, go for that. You know, follow that energy. Go where you are called. Grace be with you, all of that. However, I'm not going to pursue that uh, that line of thought or those techniques, and I'm instead going to talk to you about my alternate list, uh, which has a lot in common with my old, old friend, Enrique Enrique, but uh, also differs from his technique in a number of uh, areas. So if you're familiar with his work, then uh, you'll have some um, inkling already as to what I'm talking about. Uh, if you're not familiar for, with his work, uh, some of the things I say may be very surprising to you. They'll uh, seem very unconventional to you, uh, but I hope that you have an open mind and I really do uh, thank you for your patience and the time that you spend absorbing this new and possibly strange information. All right, uh, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make this video a little differently than my usual, you know, all one shot, all one take, Scandinavian style, dogma film school, kitchen table videos. I'm gonna actually use the new iPhone, iOS, iMovie picture in picture feature, yay, which now finally works well instead of not working so awesome as it used to. Um, and I'm gonna actually kind of cut the sections, cut this sort of video into sections, drop in the books as picture in pictures, and depending on the length, either put them together or space them out in different sections just so that it's not so overwhelming, because I'm sure that nobody wants to watch, you know, 45 minutes or an hour of different, you know, nine books on Tarot. But 
So here it is, and you know, welcome to it. And again, I, I hope you enjoy it. So just to start out, I'm going to just give you the quick list of the books that I'm going to talk about. Uh, some of them, as I said, are probably familiar to people who followed me for a long time or are familiar with the work of Enrique Enrique, and others I think will be less so. All right, so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, just begin. So the first book in my list, <clears throat> which I think is crucial and I think absolutely everyone should read, is by the Dutch cultural uh, theorist and historian Johan, and I'm going to murder this name because I don't speak Dutch at all, Huizinha, right, uh, who lived in the early part of the 20th century. And he wrote a wonderful book called Homo Ludens, or Playing Man, right, about the importance of play to human freedom and human culture. Now, uh, there are many other uh, sort of outlooks which have stressed play, but often in a functional sense. We play for this reason, we play for that reason. Of course, a function means that there's some sort of overriding purpose that guides, right? And he didn't like that concept at all. He thought that play was free and non-serious and it wasn't functional in the sense that uh, we often think of the concept of function today. Uh, and he really wanted to talk about the expansion of being almost that happens uh, when we play and how important play is to all people and to all cultures in this very free, non-serious manner, right? Um, and this is a very important book because of course when we read cards in a modern and contemporary sense, this concept of play, this freedom of play, this emphasis on free will, human growth, and um, essential pieces of consciousness or the ex essential experience of being human is something that we like to highlight with card work, which is why I think this book is very important. <laughs> Possibly the most important book you could ever read. So that's, <laughs> that's why I chose this book and, and I'll talk about it, as I said, a little later. Then after that, there are two other books that I will also discuss by the very famous Italian author, one of the greatest Italian authors of the 20th century and possibly of all time, Italo Calvino. Uh, the first book that I think um, of his, which is, you know, most important, the most important book, like if you only read two books on this list, read Homo Ludens <laughs> and read uh, Calvino's Invisible Cities, right? Now, uh, you know, uh, not a lot of people have read Invisible Cities, although I think more people are familiar with it since it's come back into popularity. It was recently made into an opera in 2014, and it was made into a really cool kind of flash mob silent opera where people sort of hung out in the Los Angeles train station and sung the cities um, of the book, uh, you know, as leader style pieces over wireless headphones and uh, you can see large sections of the performance uh, on the website Invisible Cities Opera um, and to see how amazing it is as a flash mob opera and to see the poor people in the Los Angeles train station sort of like shocked as opera singers in very casual contemporary clothes, it's a very diverse cast uh, and diverse audience, appear and suddenly begin to sing and perform modern dance uh, in the middle of the Los Angeles train station, which if, is, if, uh, if you've ever been there is not exactly the most upscale place. Let's put it that way, right? It's, uh, it's a funky public place and sometimes it's a bit down in the heels, but uh, this uh, is a wonderful opera and the score for it uh, has been uh, recorded and you can actually just buy and download that from uh, I think Amazon or iTunes if you're interested. And so we'll talk a lot about Invisible Cities, uh, the mathematical structure of um, Invisible Cities, which forms a helix or an Archimedean spiral, and the importance that uh, ideas about game and play that we can see in Homo Ludens uh, also appear in Invisible Cities. And then I also want to talk about a, a much better known book in the tarot community, uh, Calvino's Castle of Cross Destinies, which was written in two sections, one in 1969 and the other later, and they were published together, I believe, for the first time in 1973. Uh, and the Castle of Cross Destinies, as I said, it has two sections. Um, 
The first section uses the Visconti Tarot deck to tell a number of classic stories, myths and fables, and uh, it shows various ways that uh, cards can be combined. That is, it's a combinatorial narrative, right? Uh, in order to tell a wide variety of different stories at the same time, both positive and negative. Uh, so when I when I use this concept combinatorial narrative, right, it sounds all highfalutin and a little strange, but those of us who live in the contemporary world of, you know, point and click adventure games, hypertext, we're completely used to this concept, right? We are constantly you know, leaping from one section of text to another. Games uh, often can be played in any order, including backwards, right? Uh, and we're just used to this kind of uh, narrative technique and to these storytelling uh, tour de forces now in a way that was highly unusual in 1969 and in the early 70s. Uh, but yet when people go to do card work, they forget what they know, right? They sort of revert to this mythical classic form of card work um, and they just forget they just forget what we know so it's really useful to um, read the castle class of cross destinies and actually take that as a serious guide to practice and offering questions about how we use cards to create narratives uh, and what uh, different cross narratives can emerge even as we're following one thread and why we choose one thread over another thread so uh, then after that, I'd like to talk about two other pieces of text. Um, one is a book by the famous American author Robert Coover, also from 1969. It's called The Babysitter. This is another piece of combinatorial text written 167 paragraphs. It's rather dark. It's, shall we say, at certain points, not safe for work. And it really emphasizes how uh, storylines can be both positive and negative at the same time and depending on how the path you take through them goes or, or how the path you choose gets started stories can end up surprisingly dark when they don't necessarily have to be right it's sort of an accident of the way that you enter the narrative and the structure that you sort of randomly pick up or that uh, jives with currently existing structures in your language, right? You can end up in a very dark place or you can end up in a very positive place. And uh, each time you look at that book, you'll end up in a different place, right? And so as a result, it can be a very disturbing book. Some very dark things can happen in The Babysitter, but other things that are completely innocence and light can also happen in that book. And so again, that's an approach that we often need to keep in mind when we look at reading cards for the people. Uh, it's often that we see people who are new to cards end up uh, catastrophizing the cards, particularly when they see quote unquote bad cards like tower or devil or you know what other card, ten of swords, right? But that's just the, the pre-existing structure that you have for language and image and it's not necessarily the way the image has to go or the way the story has to go, right? Because this is a a combinatorial exercise, a question of combining, of threading your way through a path of possible narratives. And how you choose one or why you choose one, right, is something that we really uh, need to think about very carefully. And the methods of how those paths come to us should also be given um, great thought. And this is something that's not usually taught at all in tarot books when we just talk about, you know, spreads with positions and keywords and, you know, intuition. And this is not the kind of careful study that we need to engage, the kind of careful self-reflection that uh, we really need to confront ourselves with if we're not to harm ourselves or other people accidentally by talking to cards, by talking about them, uh, by talking to them about cards, excuse me. Then I'd like to talk about a short story by the famous uh, author Jonathan Safran Foer, which appeared in The New Yorker in 2010. Here we are quickly. Uh, this is a story that um, is focused on illogic, right, in which every sentence contradicts itself or the sentence before or after it. Um, this is just an example of cognitive, of cognitive dissonance in a beautiful and very powerful literary form. When we speak to ourselves or other people, when we look at our questions, when we look at our narratives, it's very common for us to find that we, in fact, engage <laughs> in these kinds of self-defeating contradictions Right? And we're not even aware of it, that some of these cognitive distances or competing structures that we have in our consciousness uh, constantly appear. Right? And do we recognize them? 
right? Do we confront ourselves? Do we stop ourselves at that moment and investigate how they have come about and what purpose they're serving us? And this is something that you can see in this text by Fleur. Then I'm going to talk about two other books which are more expected, although not very well liked, in any uh, list of tarot books. And that's, of course, the so-called DDD uh, by Michael Dummett, uh, Decker, and DePaulis. And that's, of course, um, Wicked Pack of Cards and the second book, History of the Occult Tarot. Um, you know, the actual scholarly documentary, art history, factual history of cards still gets short shrift to this day in the tarot community. Uh, some people still deny it and will, you know, I have often had people come right up to me and, you know, inform me that tarot is from ancient Egypt or that it's a gift from aliens to the dolphins in an effort to preserve the knowledge of Atlantis. And that's fine if you would like to believe that because I'm not going to tell you no, right? Cards are a practice and you may practice them however you like. I am not, however, going to accept that that's a useful or helpful outlook when it comes to contemporary card card work. I'm, 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 I'm very skeptical about that and I have a lot of deep reservations as to whether or not that's helpful to anybody. Um, superstition is a form of poetic living, but it is not a form of human flourishing. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. I know that's a very controversial statement. Forgive me if you disagree. That's perfectly fine, but that's just my outlook. And that's what I have discovered you know, in my own practice, working with myself and many, many other people. So kind of that's where it is. Uh, Dummett, of course, uh, takes a lot of effort at slashing and burning uh, many card myths. Uh, because he comes from Oxbridge as a don, uh, because of his background as a logician and a philosopher, he has a very harsh, combative language. Uh, this is perhaps not the kind of language that I would use when arguing this case, but, you know, Michael Dummett was one of the premier minds of the 20th century in mathematics and philosophy. So, you know, um, that's just who he was. That was just his style. And um, that aside, the facts that he states about cards are still largely true, though, of course, in any scholarly endeavor, we always update our knowledge and refine it as more documents and information become available over time. But still, the core concepts and core histories that you find in these books are, are true, and they're really an excellent basis. Um, other people say, well, yeah, sure, we know tarot starts as a game, but, you know, so what? What does that have to do with us now? Let's go ahead and just, you know, tell fortunes and live superstitions. Well, and again, that's fine with you if that's your outlook. But again, I have many instances of people who have been actively harmed by that. So that's just not where I'm at, you know? So, but if you're there, God bless you and grace to you. Okay, then the other book I'd like to talk about is again, a history book. It's by the great French games historian, Terry DePaulis. This is called Tarot Revelé. It's a book from a Swiss expo exposition of cards. Uh, in 2012. And uh, it's a wonderful just sort of uh, catalog of cards. It's short. It has some sections in English, although it's largely in French. And, you know, we'll, I've mentioned this book before in my other videos, and we'll just spend a little more time uh, with it once again. Uh, then I'd also like to talk about the last two books, what I call The Shrinks, and these are books on metaphor and uh, discussion techniques. Now, the book on metaphors, of course, by Cop right? Uh, Client-generated metaphor. And this is a very, very useful book because he, he outlines a seven-step validated process for talking to people about their metaphors. Of course, in everyday conversation, in any kind of social interaction, any kind of reading situation, casual or professional, people are going to be talking, they're going to develop a relationship of language and in language, and metaphors are going to happen because it's we're human beings and that's just how we talk, right? And the question is, is are these metaphors helping us or serving us? Uh, or are they hindering us? Or are they actively undermining us? You know, they can help us, they can be actual servants, right, beyond just mere help, or they can be obstacles to hop over, or they can literally be our enemies, right? Our, many of us have found as we've gone through life that the language we were taught as children, the negative self-talk, 
we were taught as young people actively comes back to be an obstacle for us and we need to unlearn that. The question is, is how do you do that, right? What's a proven, valid, non-harmful and successful technique for doing it? And that's what you'll find in Kopp's book and we'll talk about that. Then the last book I want to talk about is a book of motivational interviewing. Right after we've talked about our metaphors, the question is, is now how do we change? What do we do about it? How do we own that, right? How do we take concrete, positive action that empowers us based on that? And that's what motivational interviewing allows us to do by talking about the process of change, understanding that change is in fact a process that goes forward and back, that there are states of emotions that arise at different times uh, when we want to talk about changing. And um, again, this is a completely evidence-based technique. It's been rigorously tested in a number of healthcare settings and other settings. Uh, and so uh, I feel very confident using it with people because I know it is not woo, quote unquote. Not that necessarily woo is bad, but as I said, I just prefer to be able to set people um, uh, in a direction that they can then follow up for themselves, that they can choose for themselves, that is, as I've said at the beginning of this video, completely choice-centered and allows them to own their own actions and make their own commitments. Right, so uh, those are the books I'm going to talk about. As I said, I'll probably talk about it in sections because this video has already gotten a bit long. I think what I'll probably end up doing is I will upload this first section today and then the succeeding sections I will talk about just, you know, one or two books and I'll upload those over the next couple of days individually so that way people won't be overwhelmed by these enormous 45 minute videos. All right, so uh, thank you for that. I hope you're interested and of course if you have any more questions or concerns or any follow-up comments you'd like to make, please don't hesitate to contact me on social media. I'm always happy to engage with you and look forward for the actual detailed videos on the books coming soon in just a few days. Thanks so much and until then, if you don't have a chance to tune in, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Talk to you soon. Thanks.